going to see some more etchings by Rembrandt now, and while we do so, we'll hear some more music by Heinrich Schütz, who was, as I've said, the most important composer in Europe in Rembrandt's day, and the most important German composer before Bach, who was born exactly a century later. This is a portrait of Schütz by a nobody named Spettner, but as I mentioned earlier, there is also a portrait of a fellow some authorities think is Schütz by Rembrandt himself, and you see that picture now. Schutz spent most of his life in Dresden, but also spent a good deal of time in Venice, where he met and was influenced by both Giovanni Gabrielli and Claudio Monteverdi. Virtually all of his surviving output consists of settings of biblical texts, mostly in German, but he is also credited with the earliest German opera, although it doesn't survive. We'll hear one of his sacred symphonies, as they're called, on the text of Matthew chapter 11, Venite ad me, Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. This is the etching known simply as the Three Trees. This is a detail from it. The three crosses, or the crucifixion. Venita, 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 ad me. Venita, 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 ad me. And this is Rembrandt's treatment of the same passage in the Gospel of Matthew, which Schutz set to music in the piece you're hearing, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is the largest etching Rembrandt ever made, the so-called 100 guilder print, because that's what it sold for in his day, the equivalent of, of around $5,000 now. It depicts Christ healing the sick. Here's a close-up of it. And another detail, the skeptical Pharisees trying to decide what to make of it all. now the countryside near Amsterdam, to which Rembrandt could easily walk from his house near what was at that time the edge of town. Jan Six, a wealthy friend of his, owned property about where this picture was taken. And on one visit to him, Rembrandt is supposed to have made this etching while they were waiting for a servant to bring them some food at a picnic spot in the neighborhood. And we can't see the Holland of Rembrandt's day without seeing at least one windmill, and this one is also in the neighborhood of Six's property. So I figure it might have been the subject of this etching of a windmill. Rembrandt did not care much for landscape. Only about a dozen or so of the hundreds of pictures he painted can be called pure landscapes. 
But this and the three trees we saw a minute ago can also qualify as landscapes of a sort. But the landscape that really interested him was the landscape of the human face. So here he is at what we might think of as his point of maximum prosperity around the time of the Night Watch Commission, looking very confident. And here he is again a few years later in the mid-1640s after the Night Watch had been finished and his wife Saskia had died, leaving him a single father. By this time he was beginning to have financial problems, in part caused by his reluctance to paint lucrative society portraits and in part caused by the expense of his mansion of a house and his extravagant spending on things to decorate it. He looks worried here, and he had plenty of things to be worried about. He had taken a woman named Gert Dirks into the house to take care of his son Titus, and they became lovers. However, he then took a second woman, Hendrikia Stoffels, into the house as well, apparently as a general servant originally, and she also became his mistress. Now, this was a big house, but the two women found out about each other nevertheless. This is thought to be Hendrikia here. Eventually, Gertke moved out, and Rembrandt was charged with breach of promise to Mary, and although he denied making any such promise to her, a court order requiring him to pay for her support was obtained by her. In 1650, she was confined to some sort of asylum on the ground she was mentally unstable, and Rembrandt apparently had a hand in bringing this about, perhaps in the hopes that he wouldn't have to pay for her support if she were so confined, but the court required him to continue to pay her anyway. Rembrandt never married Hendrikia here either, probably because according to the terms of his first wife Saskia's will, he was to have the interest on the estate which she left to Titus only so long as he remained unmarried, and that amounted to more money than he wanted to give up. There are several pictures attributed to Rembrandt which are said to be portraits of Titus, and this is one in the Norton Simon Museum, but it's now generally thought not to be by Rembrandt. Because they were unmarried and living in sin, Hendrikia was suspended from the church. But since Rembrandt was no longer a practicing member, there was nothing the church could do about him. Hendrikia was in fact reinstated when her illegitimate daughter by Rembrandt, Cornelia, was baptized. Although they never married, she remained his wife in all but name until her death at just 37 in 1663. This is another alleged Rembrandt, which, if authentic, might well be a portrait of Titus. Simon Schama at least thinks it's legitimate. It's in the Boymans Museum in Rotterdam. By the early 1650s, Rembrandt was beginning his last period and painting more and more again. And apart from the Night Watch and the Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Tolt, most of the more familiar pictures we associate with him come from this last period. <laughs> Until the recent investigations of the RRC, the Rembrandt Research Committee, this was always regarded as one of the most impressive of Rembrandt's paintings, the so-called Polish Rider, assigned to the year 1653 in the Frick collection, but the attribution of it to Rembrandt is now regarded as questionable. Since only about 10% of all alleged Rembrandts can be attributed to him on the basis of documentary evidence, there certainly is plenty of room for controversy over which pictures he did paint. Thomas Hoving, for what his opinion as a connoisseur is worth, says that the Polish writer simply must be by Rembrandt. And Simon Schama also says the picture is certainly by him, and the late H.W. Jansen, I'm sure, never, never gave any thought to the possibility it might not be by him. But Bob Hawk of the RRC says it's too weak, and his fellow committee member Ernst van de Vettering says the figure is too slim to be by Rembrandt. I don't know whether Rembrandt painted the picture or not, but to suppose anyone is going to be convinced by talk like that is silly. All this does is illustrate how far connoisseurship is from science. 
To avoid sounding like fools, the committee members need to just say yes, no, or maybe and leave it at that. I think one thing in favor of this being by Rembrandt is just the cursory treatment given to the landscape and the horse. Rembrandt did not typically pay much attention to either landscape or animals, and this is one of the ugliest landscapes with one of the ugliest horses anyone ever painted. On the other hand, something against this being by Rembrandt is the good looks of the rider. If this is by Rembrandt, it's probably the handsomest face he ever painted. As I've said before, we don't fall in love after considering a list of qualities a person possesses. We fall in love and then if someone asks us why her, all we can do is come up with some post facto unconvincing reasons like she's cute, a good cook, rich, whatever. But we didn't fall in love after considering a list of reasons like this. We fall in love first, and then we make up the reasons afterward to try to explain the thing. Likewise, Ernst van de Vettering doesn't really think the Polish writer is not by Rembrandt because the figure is too slim. He feels it's not by Rembrandt, and he gives us this as a reason by way of trying, like the lover, to explain what is not really subject to successful explanation at all. But telling us the figure's too weak or too slim or whatever isn't going to make most of us feel the way he does any more than we would fall in love with his wife if he told us she was cute and a good cook and rich. This is Rembrandt's Aristotle contemplating a bust of Homer, which is, contra the Polish writer, one of his most well-documented pictures. Thomas Hoving arranged for the purchase of this when he was running the New York Met in 1961. When the trustees balked at the $2.3 million price tag, he countered that Aristotle's gold chain alone was worth more than $2.3 million, and the sale went through. And he later bragged that he had bought the first painting Americans had ever stood in line to see. It was commissioned by a Sicilian named Antonio, Antonio Rufo, who had apparently come to know of Rembrandt through etchings he had seen. Eventually, Rembrandt also painted at least two more pictures for him, one of Homer and one of Alexander the Great, and he also sold him 189 prints. Rufo had apparently asked simply for a picture of a half-length figure and decided after he received this that the subjects were Aristotle and Homer, which they may well be, although it has been argued that it is Apolles, the favorite painter of Alexander the Great, rather than Aristotle, who is contemplating Homer. Aristotle and Homer do make an interesting juxtaposition, though. Science and knowledge contemplating art and poetry, the mind contemplating the soul, the real versus the ideal, the world versus the spirit. began to paint more again in the 1650s, he also returned to portraits, and this one of Jan Six now is considered to be his greatest. This is also a very well documented picture because it has been owned by the subject's descendants for the past 350 years. There are a few families which still own pictures of their ancestors which were painted that long ago. But of course, there are many, many more families which don't own such things. Not very many families have been so consistently prosperous over three or four hundred years that they can afford the luxury of keeping millions, or in this case tens of millions of dollars, tied up in one painting. In most families, at least once every few generations, a wastrel will come along who would rather have a Ferrari than a picture of great-great-great-great-great-grandfather on the wall. Jan Six here was an important political figure. He was the son-in-law of Nicholas Tulp, the doctor in the anatomy lesson by Rembrandt. He was something of a scholar, and he had, like Rembrandt himself, attended the University of Leiden. A lot's been written about the expression on his face, what large or small thoughts he might be thinking, and there's a certain similarity between Aristotle and Six here. If Six's right arm were extended, the two figures would be 
close to duplicates in the way they're positioned. But in 1653, the year before this was painted, he had loaned Rembrandt $50,000 interest-free, and Rembrandt is said to have given him this in lieu of any interest payment. In fact, however, it turned out to be in lieu of any payment whatever. Rembrandt couldn't pay him back, and it's always seemed to me that Six here looks a lot like a man who's just been told he's lost $50,000. Their friendship did end, and when Six married Tope's daughter, Govert Flink, rather than Rembrandt, was commissioned to paint the wedding picture. Here's Rembrandt himself again about the same time, looking as though he might just be thinking he should tell Six, well, if that's the way you feel, go and never darken my door again. In the full-length view of this portrait, Rembrandt does look pugnacious and challenging with his hands on his hips. And Closer, he definitely looks worried, and within a year, he was, in fact, to be bankrupt. In 1656, he had to submit to an auction of all things of value in the house, and the record of this, at the cost of his personal tragedy, might be thought to give us a look at the nature of the man through the nature of the stuff, but I'm not sure about this. The largest category of things auctioned would be works of art, which is hardly surprising, and much of the rest of the stuff could probably be put in the category of props, things like a cannon, a so-called giant's helmet, a large piece of seaweed, some shrunken heads, and there were also 70 of his own paintings, some of which, at least it seems he could have sold if he'd, if he'd wanted to. The remaining items were mostly just household things, pots, pans, cupboards, chairs, and the like. He apparently didn't have to actually leave the house until 1660, and then he moved with Hendrickia and Titus to this address, 184 Rosengrocht, but the house is not the one he knew, and only the plaque on the wall connects it to him. Titus and Hendrickia now formed a sort of dummy corporation which would employ Rembrandt, and this would allow them to take in money for commissions, from which they would then pay Rembrandt himself a small salary, and this would prevent his creditors from claiming the wholesale price for his pictures. Here's another self-portrait of just about this time, 1659, and despite the fact that his style was coming more and more to be regarded as old-fashioned, as portrait commissions went more and more to Van Dyck wannabes, who could have made even Rembrandt himself look good, he did get important work to do. When the town hall was finished, his former pupil, Govert Flink, who had been chosen over Rembrandt to paint the sixth wedding picture, was also chosen over him to paint the Oath of the Batavians, or the Conspiracy of Claudius Civilis, as it's sometimes called, to be displayed there, but Flink died at the start of the project, and the job was then given to Rembrandt. This was his last big chance to reestablish himself as the leading painter in Holland, to get rich again, to have his name mentioned in the same sentence with those of Rubens and Raphael, then he blew it completely. The original picture was probably a little bigger than the night watch, around 20 feet high, but it was later cut in half, and what you see here then is more or less the lower center of the picture as it was displayed when it was finished. The subject is the oath by which the leaders of Holland, or Batavia in Roman times, swore to throw off Roman rule. It's roughly the equivalent of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, and the Amsterdam burghers expected something bright and triumphant, with probably a lot of flags waving and trumpets blowing. In any case, they did not expect their heroes to come across looking like sloppily painted pirates. Here's the right-hand section up closer. What's actually said to be true of the Night Watch actually is true of the Oath of the Batavians. No one liked it. It was actually hung for about a year, but in 1662, Rembrandt was told that it was simply not what was wanted. 
and the canvas was rolled up and delivered to his house. He then cut it in half and sold the part with the figures we see now to a Swede for $3,000, and it's still in Stockholm. The picture was just too experimental, and even today I think it's one of the pictures by Rembrandt which is hardest to like. Here's the leader of the conspiracy up close, but again, is this the way you want the George Washington of your country to look? Like a one-eyed barbarian? The adjective Shakespearean is often used by art historians in attempting to convey the atmosphere of the picture, and this does seem to me to fit, but that doesn't mean I would give up Macbeth for it. While he was working on the Oath of the Batavians, he got a commission for a group portrait from the Syndics of the Drapers Guild, as the fellows in this picture are usually called. They had the job of overseeing the quality of cloth produced by their guild members, and could find those who tried to sell inferior material. It appears, in fact, that some sort of accounting business is being done as the subject of the picture. If this so, it's interesting because although there were group portraits of a sort painted in the Renaissance, especially in Renaissance Italy, they are virtually always set in a religious context. The Medici would never have dreamt of having their portraits painted, counting their money. It looks like we could have an illustration here of Weber's Protestant ethic, except for the fact that two of the five syndics were Catholics. The fellow in the back standing was just a clerk. Despite the success of this picture, which might, even in the face of the town hall debacle, have brought him some more commissions, most of Rembrandt's pictures painted in the late 1650s and 1660s were probably uncommissioned, and many are of biblical subjects, which were just not as popular as they had been earlier in his career. This is Jacob blessing the sons of Joseph, or actually blessing Ephraim, the younger one, who was in effect chosen by God to be the greater of the two. In these later pictures, Rembrandt usually chooses subjects which are subtle and not at least superficially dramatic. The feeling here is one of a torch being passed from the older generation to the younger, from grandfather through the father who supports the hand to grandson. This is a closer view of Jacob and his son Joseph. In the Bible, Joseph is described as displeased with his father's blessing of Ephraim, but there's no hint of displeasure in this. Rembrandt continued to get occasional commissions in the 1660s, which gave him enough to survive, and some money was available from Saskia's bequest to Titus when he became 21, although much of that had been promised to creditors. The prodigal son was painted the year Rembrandt died in 1669. Hendrickia had died in 1664, and Titus had died of the plague still in his 20s in 1668, just after his marriage. Rembrandt's illegitimate daughter by Hendrickia, Cornelia, had married a sea captain and moved to Indonesia. So Rembrandt was essentially alone. It's possible that in painting this subject, he was representing his own return to religious faith, or asking forgiveness for his own sins, but not everything a genius does is so obviously biographical as such an interpretation would make this picture. The presentation in the temple which you see now is said to have been on an easel in his studio when Rembrandt died, and it is often said to have been his last work, and again it's tempting to read something biographical into the subject. Simeon, who recognizes the Savior, tells the Lord he can now die at peace. Nunc dimittis, he says, now, O Lord, dismiss thy servant. Rembrandt was buried without ceremony under the floor of the Vesterkirk, but bones were regularly dug up and replaced by new burials, so it's unlikely there's anything of him left there. He had, in fact, already sold the place he had bought for Saskia's bones in the outer kirk, so they were thrown in the dump even in his lifetime but the Calvinists discouraged worrying about the fate of the material body. We'll finish his career now by seeing some of the self-portraits he painted over the last 10 years or so of his life,
And while we do this, we'll hear part of Schutz's Magnificat. This was painted in 1658, about the time of his bankruptcy. This was painted in 1660 when he was working on the Oath of the Batavians. This was painted in 1664, the year Hendrikia died. This was painted in 1669, the year Rembrandt himself died. This was also painted the year he died, and Sa Simon Shama thinks this is his last self-portrait. This was also painted the year he died, and many do believe that it is in fact his last self-portrait. Now the Amsterdam Gate in Harlem, and if you are going from Amsterdam to Harlem in the 17th century, as we are now, you would have passed through it. Amsterdam is of course associated with the great era of Dutch art in the 17th century, but of the most important artists of that period, only Rembrandt spent his whole adult life there. If there's any city which should be regarded as the Florence of Holland, I think it's probably Harlem, not Amsterdam. Even during the Renaissance, important artists were coming from there, although often choosing to take their careers to what were then more profitable venues. Among them were Klaus Schluter, usually regarded as the greatest sculptor of the Northern Renaissance, who worked for the Duke of Burgundy, Philip the Bold, you might remember. There was Dirk Bouts and Gerard David, both of whom spent most of their lives in Flanders. And there was Gert Gentot St. Jans, who was probably not born in Harlem, but did spend much of his life there. This is the Grote Mark, the main square with the late Gothic Grote Kirk, said to have the loudest organ in the world. It's said that it can be heard in Amsterdam, ten miles away if conditions are right. Next to it's the building of the Butcher's Guild, which is, however, only 18th century as it stands now. In addition to the important Renaissance artists associated with the city, during the 17th century, the greatest landscape painter ever, Jakob van Roystal, was born here, as was his uncle Salomon, who was also an important painter. Philip Vuvermans, considered the battle painting specialist of the century, was born here. And so was Franz Hals, now considered second only to Rembrandt as a portrait painter in their century. <laughs> 
We'll hear more about Roystal in a bit and about Vuvermans next week, but this is a group portrait of the Company of St. George by Halls. Halls was about 27 years younger than Rembrandt, but almost outlived him, despite, according to legend anyway, pursuing a lifestyle not usually associated with longevity. Halls' Militia Company portraits are perhaps not always considered his greatest pictures, but I'm sure everyone in the company of St. George here was pleased with the way he and the group as a whole turned out in this picture. It's a colorful, bright, and full of life composition. It may not approach the sort of metaphysical atmosphere of the Night Watch, but the figures are arranged in a natural and realistic way that I imagine Rembrandt himself would have liked, and the end result has something about it that could even be described as majestic. Here it is up closer. If I'd been in charge of picking a painter to do my group, I think I might well have picked Halls over Rembrandt. He had Halls, a reputation for working very quickly, and up close to a picture like this, you can see that some parts of the costumes, anyway, were painted in just a few strokes. We've come a long way from the Flemish focus on meticulous detail by the time we get to this. Despite his reputation for working quickly, only about 200 original pictures by him are thought to survive, although like many other artists of the day, he ran a workshop which duplicated many of his paintings over and over to the confusion of modern connoisseurs. It may be that the fact he was a heavy drinker who kept falling in canals and was in constant trouble kept his output low, but it is, as I suggested, uh, now generally thought he was probably no more like the tipplers and rowdies he sometimes painted than Peter Bruegel was like the ignorant peasants he painted. He seems to have been confused with another fellow Halls with the same name by careless or sensation-seeking biographers, so the relatively small output for a man who apparently worked very fast remains a little bit of a puzzle. This is a portrait by him of Willem van Heethusen. Many of his portraits have a kind of candid quality as though he just happened to set up his easel in a tavern and painted a picture, sort of like a quick sketch artist, but we have no authoritative record of what his method was. Here's Daniel Van Aken in a similarly candid portrait. And Nicholas Hassler, who was burgomaster of the city, but could be mistaken for just another patron of the tavern. No sketches by Halls survive, which supports the view that he worked right on the canvas without giving much preliminary thought to things like composition. Like Rembrandt and Velasquez, he understood that to produce a convincing picture of something in the real world, you don't have to try to reproduce the thing in every detail. This is the picture by him in the Wallace Collection in London called The Laughing Cavalier, and it's one of his best known. It may be a portrait, but it's thought likely to be simply a figure of Hall's imagination. Hall's discovered that there was a big market for what one might call human still lifes. People would buy interesting faces, not their own. <laughs> The fellow known as the Jolly Drinker here certainly seems unlikely to have paid to have his portrait painted. And this woman, whose image was one of those most often copied by Hall's assistants and others without his authorization, is known as the Malababa, or Old Witch. Someone once did what passed for a scientific study to show that people would look longer at something grotesque than they would at something beautiful. And that may explain the popularity of this, and Rembrandt's rat catcher too, I guess. This fellow who looks sort of like the Tom Sawyer of his day uh, certainly didn't have enough money to have his portrait painted, I'm sure. <laughs> 
Like Rembrandt and Vermeer, whom we'll get to next week, Halls fell into debt and eventually became dependent on a pension from the city. The Franz Halls Museum now occupies the old men's home in Harlem, where it is generally thought he ended his days, although that tradition apparently doesn't rest on documentary evidence. It's been extensively reconstructed, but still has a good deal of the atmosphere of the original 17th century place. Here it is inside, being visited by a couple of ladies who could pass for the 17th century regents of the place. In the picture that is usually now considered Hall's most impressive accomplishment, the regents of the old men's home now on display in this museum. And here it is. Painted when he was in his 80s. One can make out a case that Rembrandt's most impressive portrait is the one of Jan Six, which is, of all the pictures he painted, perhaps the one most done in the style of Franz Hall's. And on the other hand, one can claim that Hall's most impressive portrait, or group portrait in this case, is the one which is most in the style, or at least in the mood, of Rembrandt. It's often suggested that there's something vaguely malicious about Hall's treatment of his subjects here, but I think four of the five are actually smiling slightly. This is a sort of a smile, isn't it? Pretty much the whole of Harlem can be found in Hall's work. Laughing boys, musicians and barflies, merchants and cavaliers, witches and politicians, and the regents of the old men's home. As I said, the man often called the greatest landscape painter ever, Jakob van Roystal was also born in Harlem, and this is one of his most well-known pictures, the Jewish graveyard, although I don't really know why it's called a Jewish graveyard. There's an undeniable atmosphere of 19th century romanticism about this that explains why Goethe called it his favorite picture, and why Vincent Price, the actor connoisseur who made a career out of exploiting the mysterious, the monstrous, the dark and the occult side of Romanticism in Hollywood said that it was his favorite painting too, the one he'd most like to own. Thomas Gray's reference to the paths of glory leading but to the grave also comes to mind. Far from the madding crowd's ignoble strife, some mute inglorious Milton here may rest, some Cromwell guiltless of his country's blood. Most of Roystal's landscapes do not seem, in such an overt way at least, to make a metaphysical point about the transience of human lives, things, and affairs against the enduring stage of nature on which we strut and fret and then are heard no more, but there is a kind of brooding, sometimes almost threatening atmosphere in his pictures. They rarely depict landscape which is superficially grand, like the Alps, say, and Many, at least, are thought to have been painted plain air. Some, in fact, think he was the first artist to actually take his easel out into the country and paint on location. Someone once asked Winston Churchill why he liked to paint landscapes more than portraits, and his answer was, no landscape ever complained about its likeness. And Roystal's landscapes may really be the first portraits, as it were, of real landscapes. It's perhaps a bit surprising to find the Dutch more fascinated by landscape in the late 17th century than probably any other people because the landscape of their country is on the whole so unexceptional. Although, of course, a great artist can make a very impressive work of art out of something that may seem very ordinary at first sight. This is another Roystal landscape also, of course, the Dutch were perhaps the most urbanized people in Europe in the 17th century, and that might also make their interest in landscape seem surprising. But after all, where do most of the members of the Sierra Club live? In San Francisco, right? 
It's the urbanite who likes to romanticize about nature, not the farmer in Nebraska. As Henry Tomlinson once said, The sea is at its best in a chair before the fire. We're going to see some more of Roystal's landscapes now, and hear an organ piece by Dietrich Buxtehude, the man who amazed the teenaged Handel and whom Bach walked 200 miles in the winter to hear play in Lübeck in northern Germany, about 300 miles from Harlem. He's generally now considered second only to Bach as a composer for the organ. We'll hear his prelude and fugue in G minor. Okay, that's where we'll wind up this lecture. Next week, we'll visit Delft and hear about Vermeer and then have the Thirty Years' War. Uh, a little bit of something for everybody. <laughs>